This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you, including Kevin, Paul Thiessen, Ali Sanjabi, and our brand new patron today, Sarah. Not Sarah Lane. On this episode of Daily Tech News Show, we discuss why foldables may be the best form factor of all, Sarah Lane's reaction to her domain name getting shuttled from Google to Squarespace, and Reddit's not going to budge on API fees, but will they take to actually kicking out protesting mods? Why are you so mad? This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, June 16th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Zipline, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. If you liked the Bay Area references on Thursday's show, just wait till you get a load of the Think You Should Leave references <laughs> coming in this one. Let's start with the quick hits. The Verge confirmed with Meta spokesperson Joe Osborne that the company plans to lower the minimum age to use the Quest VR headsets from 13 to 10. Parents will have to approve accounts for younger children, and Meta will only recommend age-appropriate apps. No ads will be shown to them. Profiles for 10 to 12-year-olds will also be set to private by default. Baby of the year. We'll probably use it. Intel announced its Tunnel Falls quantum processor meant for research labs investigating quantum computing. Tunnel Falls has 12 qubits. That's a, a unit of processing used in quantum computing, and it's not a lot of them. For example, IBM has a commercial version of 127 qubits. But Intel's chips are smaller, and the company hopes its reputation as a chip maker will help it gain business from financial service companies, big R&D outfits. The University of Maryland, for example, is one of its first customers. Quantum computing is still very much in the research stage, uh, but has promise to dramatically speed up certain kinds of computing, especially in areas involving math. Mercedes-Benz is testing using ChatGPT to power a voice assistant in its cars. More than 900,000 vehicles in the U.S. will be able to beta test the feature by saying, Hey Mercedes, I want to join the beta program. Mercedes says it can be used to handle questions from anything like a driver's destination to ideas for recipes. There was a lot of recipes. the grocery store. Yeah, there were, they kept mentioning recipes. I thought that was... An interesting thing to do in your car. But yeah, sure. You go to the grocery store. That's a good point. U.S.'s Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, a.k.a. CISA, confirmed that multiple federal agencies have been affected by attacks exploiting a security vulnerability in Move It Transfer, an, an enterprise file transfer tool developed by Progress Software. CISA also said the attacks were linked to the Russia-based CLOP ransomware gang, that's spelled C-L-O-P, but did not elaborate on how many U.S. agencies might have been affected. The Department of Energy confirmed to TechCrunch that two of its entities are among those that were breached. Intel and Micron both detailed plans to diversify their chip production outside the U.S. and China. Intel CEO Pat Gelser out announced a $4.6 billion chip facility in Poland. Mic uh, Micron is close to a $1 billion commitment to build a packaging factory in India. And despite China restricting its companies from buying Micron products, Micron also announced it will spend $600 million dollars to acquire a packaging facility owned by a third party inside of one of Micron's campuses in Xi'an. All right. Let's talk a little bit about this domain name shuffle you're going to have to do. Yeah, let's do it. So Google announced it's shutting down its domain name registrar called Google Domains. Um, I am one of the people who uses Google Domains for a variety of domains. So here's the deal. Squarespace will take over the business and all of its assets in a deal expected to close in Q3 of this year. So not far off. So customers of Google Domains will have their registrations transitioned over to Squarespace over the coming months. You might say that might not go well, but hey, hasn't happened yet. Hopefully, if it does, Squarespace says it will honor all existing renewal prices for at least a year. <laughs> Just that year. Squarespace also will provide domains for Google Workspace customers. And in fact, the terms of the deal also make Squarespace the exclusive domains provider for any customer purchasing a domain along with their Workspace subscription from Google directly for a minimum of three years. Now, Rob, uh, I am a Google Domains user. I am 
slightly concerned about this. I know you are as well. So how are you feeling about that? So I have a couple of domains that are right now registered with Google. And it was one of those things to where I was setting up Google workspaces and it just made it easy to do it. Um, Mm. I'm not terribly concerned um, with them being moved over to Squarespace. I have moved many domain between registrars before and haven't really had any issues with it. So I would imagine that Google and Squarespace are going to figure out a way to do it effectively. But for me, since I don't use Squarespace for anything, I probably will opt to have mine moved over to, uh, you know, Namecheap, which I've, you know, I've been using them for years as well, just so I can have all my domains in one place. So it's, it's an issue, but it's just, it's not a big issue. And, you know, I, I kind of understand why Google is doing it. I know there's a lot of people who are upset about it, but this is just not a core part of their business. Google is about, we do things that makes us money. Being a domain register is not one of those things. Yeah. So Google domains, um, I was not, I don't know, for whatever reason, um, I have a variety of domains that I, you know, have to pay annually for. And I was using a a registrar called Dotster for years. I mean, you know, from like the early 2000s, it was just what I used. It's what I paid for. And over time, there were strange fees that kept getting added to my annual fee to the point where I was like, well, this is cost prohibitive. Google domains was not free, but it was very much cheaper. So I was like, oh, well, I'm over on Google anyway. Let's just like move the, you know, the stuff I have off of Dotster onto Google domains, which was not um, a totally painless process, but it was easy enough. So for, you know, for this to now go to Squarespace, which I'm also a member of, I have a couple of domains that, you know, I'm familiar with Squarespace. I'm familiar with, you know, you know, what I have to pay for. I wonder what what this is going to look like uh, in a year when Squarespace says, okay, well, we gave you a year and now here's what you have to pay in order to be part of the Squarespace domain community. Yeah, I I wonder, you know, having it be Squarespace, I think is going to give people a lot of misimpressions of how this is going to work, uh, just because you think of Squarespace as the web host. But Squarespace being a domain name registrar really doesn't mean anything different than uh, when you sign up for Google Workspace and they offer you a domain Squarespace will handle the backend transaction. I doubt you ever even leave a Google page when you do it. It's just Squarespace going to operate it. They're they're basically outsourcing it here. Mm. So I wonder how much the price is going to change simply because Google will not want it to be too much, too expensive either. Uh, I'm trying to take a quick look at what Squarespace charges now. Um, It says that you can get it between $20 and $70 a year. So if it's somewhere around there, would that would that set you off? If it's closer to 20, then no. <laughs> 20 it's closer not so bad, to 70, 70 then yes. Yeah. Right. yeah. You know, that so was one- that was sort of why I left my 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 former um place that I, you know, had 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 parked a few things. But but yeah, I mean, I'm actually a fan of Squarespace. I I've been using it for a long time. You know, my my personal uh, website is on Squarespace, but that's hosting and you know and and a, a variety of design. It's it's not exactly the same as what this is. So yes, I I guess I'm optimistically, but um, but uh, also a little suspicious about. I think that how it, how a it's lot of work. folks, a lot of folks just. Eh, it's it's not a big deal. I don't care. I'm one of those folks. I've got dozens of domains. I mean, you know, I have well over 50 domains. So for wow. me, an additional yeah. three or four dollars a month, and you multiply that you know, times that many, that you know, that adds up really quickly. So uh, since I am going to move, I only had two there. It wasn't a big deal for me. But now that I'm, I have the opportunity to do something different. I'll just shift them over to a place that is a domain register first, they tend to keep their prices lower than mm-hmm. companies that do other stuff and offer domain um, hosting services. Yeah. A techno Mitch is asking the kind of question I imagine a lot of folks have. Is Squarespace going to ask if you have an account with them if your Google domain is under a different email? Again, I don't expect that this will route you through squarespace.com and the web hosting part. My guess is that this will just be embedded in Workspace. Uh, and when you you know, when you sign up, you, you sign up through Google and Squarespace is managing it. Um, if you already have a Squarespace account for web hosting, maybe you'll be able to manage it over there too. 
Uh, but I, I don't know that they'll make you do that. That would be an interesting thing to see. Uh, there's no reason it should make you do that. I don't know. I've 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 had domain names going back to the network solutions days when you didn't even have a choice. Uh, so sometimes <laughs> I, I think it's you know we're we're kind of spoiled for choice these days and the costs. Uh, you you should shop around like Sarah's saying. Like if if the price goes up, just take it somewhere else. It's not that hard to transfer a domain. I keep most of mine on Hover these days, and I'm pretty happy with them because they they take good care of me and their prices may not be the ultimately cheapest every time that there's a renewal, but they're never high enough that it's worth my time to change it. They're always with in a couple dollars so uh yeah your mileage may vary though and this i think rob I, I think what you're doing makes sense which is this is an opportunity to reevaluate and go like oh well since it's moving anyway let me see if i should move it somewhere else right. we've been talking a lot about foldables lately what with the galaxy z fold success and the upcoming july announcement that samsung is going to do uh we talked to is actor on monday uh, and had had some praise for the razor plus We've got the Google Pixel Fold coming out in, what, like 12 days, something like that. And Gadget's Sam Rutherford talked to two Google Pixel product managers about how the Pixel Fold plans to distinguish itself. They mentioned that it is shaped more like a passport than a typical phone. They think that makes it easier to use when it's closed. They worked a lot on continuity of apps so that apps will work seamlessly between the two screens, something Razer Plus also did. Uh, they moved the hinges to the edge of the device to decrease the thickness. It's 12.1 millimeters when closed. But the big one that caught my attention is that like the Razer Plus, which has a 3.6 inch front screen, they focused on that outer screen. Pixel Fold has a nice big one. It's 5.8 inches. It's normal phone sized. And using it without unfolding it is something they paid a lot of attention to. Uh, we just got some leaks today that the Galaxy Z Flip 5 seems to have a large cover screen as well. Now, considering that emphasis, considering that the new thing is to have a usable screen on the outside when it's folded, and then roll in the, this article by the Verge's David Pierce that he wrote on Tuesday, extolling, among other things, the virtue of being able to use a phone while folded when you want as one of the reasons that he thinks foldables are the future. In fact, the article is called Every Smartphone Should Be a Flip Phone Starting Right Now. Rob, do you agree? I'm not necessarily willing to go that far. I am willing to say, however, that I think foldables are here to stay, so much so that a company named Apple is probably going to start looking at these things pretty quick and in a hurry. And here's my reasons why. Um, with that new Razor, is it, is it the Razor Plus, the one that has that nice you know, um, you know, know, screen on the front? Yep. My, my daughter, who was all in on iPhone, her first question was, Dad, can I run iMessage on that? Uh-huh. Um, and I was like, no, it's not an iPhone. She's like, oh, that's really cute. So the fact that there's nothing that was going to get her off of an iPhone except for cuteness. And Apple's going to have to, they're going to have to deal with that. These foldable phones are really cute. And the fact that they're making the screens more usable on the outside where you can use it like a regular phone when you don't have it unfolded and then you get the added benefit of having a small tablet in your pocket um, I think a lot of people are going to start looking at that. Um, not enough that's going to, you know, make Apple make drastic changes, but I do think that you're going to probably before too long start hearing rumors coming out of Apple that they're working on a foldable. It's really interesting, Rob, that your daughter was like, that's cute. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, we don't all, you know, buy phones based on how cute they are or, you know, devices in general. But if you if you say, you know, I, I, I like this form factor, but can I do the things that I used to do on the other phone on this? Because if so, then I've got more real estate. That's yep. where you that, that's where it gets interesting. And I have been shuttling back and forth when I go from one phone to another between large and small. Uh, I, the, the, this one I have is a large screen The the iPhone that I have now is a large screen because I wanted the large screen, but then once I got it, I was like, oh, but this thing is so bulky in a pocket and carrying it around, you know? And then the last time I did that, I went to the smaller screen because of that. And then I missed the larger screen. My Android phone is a foldable. It's a Microsoft Duo because then I can just open it up, but I can't use it when it's folded up. So I'm looking forward to trying out the Pixel Fold because 
I think there is something compelling if they can get the price down. I'm assuming they can eventually get the price down. And if they can get that hinge nice and flat, which it looks like, you know, Pixel and Samsung both and even Motorola are making progress towards. If you can just have something in your pocket that feels small, like an old, like five inch phone where it's like barely, barely even notice it at all, slips in a handbag really easily. But when you want it to be a seven inch, when you want it to be a gigantic screen, it's even bigger than the 6.8 inch screens that you get in the large phones. That, that to me feels right. That feels like the kind of form factor we want. And these are have gone from like, how are you going to make that work? Is the hinge going to break to uh, can you make it thin enough? And I, I, I think there this, this form factor is definitely maturing. And Sarah, to your point about people looking at phones because they're cute. Well, back in the day, we're all old enough to remember that before smartphones, as we know them now, how your phone looked was a big reason why you got a particular phone or another phone. It was just, Oh, I like how this one looks. This is really cute. Oh yeah. So like I said, I'm giving you firsthand knowledge. My daughter, the re the only thing that made her look at something that was not an iPhone was because it was cute. That's what drew her to it. Now, stealth Dave says, uh, farewell battery life. Um, which is a good question, but one of the things that they mentioned in this in Gadget uh, interview was that they felt like the battery life would improve because you could do so many things on that small screen with it folded up. So you don't have to be using the full screen all the time, which means you're drawing on the power less. Good point. Yeah, just saying. All right, folks, uh, we are 413 people away from our goal of 4,000 patrons. Uh, it's a tall order for us to get this done by June 29th, but we know we can make it happen because y'all are amazing. So thank you to everybody who has joined us on Patreon. Uh, thank you to everyone who is about to join us on Patreon, because if we get to that goal, uh, we can make sure that Molly Wood is on the show at least once a month uh, on Fridays uh, to have fun with us. She'd be here right now uh, talking with with me and Rob and Sarah. Uh, so if you if you like Molly Wood, if if you'd like to, to see her hang out with us more often, uh, please go to patreon.com slash DTNS. Previously on Reddit, Reddit announced new fees to its APIs. Several third-party app makers, most prominently Apollo, said it's too expensive and they would shut down on June 30th before the API fees kicked in. More than 8,000 subreddits went dark on Monday for at least 48 hours to protest, and around 4,000 are still dark. Now on to the latest news. Okay, so on Thursday, Reddit CEO Steve Huffman told The Verge he doesn't plan to change the API pricing. Huffman said, quote, that's our business decision, and we're not undoing that business decision, end quote. He told The Verge and NBC News he doesn't believe most users support the moderators who have closed off the subreddits, at least not anymore. We've got a little bit of a waiting game going on. But Reddit said, in fact, uh, a fact sheet that was published, uh, published on Thursday said it's not shutting down discussions or unilaterally reopening communities. But, Tom, there is more. Yes, unilaterally doesn't mean if we got somebody else on board, they might not shut it down. Uh, NBC yeah. News mm -hmm. Uh, NBC News said Huffman was pursuing a plan to, quote, allow ordinary users to vote moderators out more easily if their decisions aren't popular. That's not unilateral, right? Uh, he did say he had no timeline for such a change and expects the protest might just end voluntarily first, and he'd prefer that. Reddit also sent messages to mods at some of the dark subreddits offering to help remove or reorder the moderator teams if some of the mods favored reopening. Finishing that memo with, if you are not able or willing to reopen and maintain the community, please let us know. Now, that's notable because Reddit also told The Verge that inactive subreddits may be in violation of Rule 4 of Reddit's Code of Conduct. That one requires moderators to be active and engaged. And it's one thing to keep it dark for 48 hours, but if you start keeping it dark for a, for a week, the argument could be made, yeah, well, you're not being active and engaged. It could be made that you're not, you're, not, you're not being a good mod. Yeah, you're, you're not making it, it open. Or to worse, people. yeah. Yeah. So I 
I, I read Selig's interview with The Verge earlier this week. And if you heard heard me on GDI, I, I went in at length about how he just sounded reasonable. He didn't sound like he was mad. It sounded like somebody was like, I really wanted that, to make this that, work. They're not talking the, to me. That's the dev who runs Apollo. Right. Exactly. That's the guy yeah. who runs Apollo. Uh, and he he struck me as someone who, who wishes it was different, but he's in a pickle. Uh, I read last night the interview with CEO Steve Hoffman from Reddit, and he struck me at first in that article as somebody reasonable, but as the it, the conversation went on, he started to throw shade on people. He started to be a little more emotional. His PR people had to step in a couple times and try to disrupt the interview and say, oh, you're, at, you're asking him the same question over and over again. Uh, and it struck me as somebody who doesn't have a solid ground to stand on. So I don't know, Rob, Sarah, if you can make any uh, heads or tails out of this, but it really... It, it seems odd for somebody who wants to resolve something to start threatening moderators. It just, it, it, this strikes me as odd. Rob, I'll, I'll just, I'll say this and I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to you. My, um, you know, having followed the story over the last week, um, I find it baffling, mind boggling that somebody who's running Reddit has, uh, is so out of touch with uh, the way that Reddit and subreddits specifically, and moderators work and have built communities and are upset about this. Now, I'm not saying that Reddit really, you know, if Reddit says, this is this is our only recourse, we have to, you know, we, we have to make the API fees, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, we have to uh, raise them. This is what we were going to do anyway. We're trying to IPO later this year. We have no choice. That would be one thing. But that's not what the company is saying, at least not, you know, outwardly. So I, you know, I, I would be, I would be, I would be pretty mad um, uh, if, you know, if I was one of the communities who was like, hey, we want an answer. And the company is like, eh, we never really thought that, you know, API stuff was, you know, our bread and butter and uh, we don't care about you anymore. Well, e even worse, I, I think their answer is talk to your moderators. It's their fault, not ours. Yeah, so right, but like, what are the moderators going to do? You know, like the moderators, what are they going to pony up like many millions of dollars per no, year? The, the like, moderate no. the moderators should unblock their their subreddits and stop protesting. That's Reddit's position. Yeah, yeah. Reddit, Reddit. As this story progresses, it seems like they're moving into prickish moves. Um, just just to call a spade a spade. So I will talk out of both sides of my mouth. I understand Reddit is a business. And, you know, when I think about uh, Apollo, I feel bad for the developer of Apollo and the users of Apollo because uh, they actually have a application that they really, really love. And these are probably some of the biggest power users of Reddit through this application. So I feel for them. But I don't feel terrible because you ultimately were playing in another company, Sandbox, who is subject to at any time make rule changes that may adversely and in this case did adversely affect you. But when you start really kind of, you know, screwing the nails hard, it's like it's like Reed Hoffman is like, you know, are, are you upset that you made a decision that you're user base doesn't agree with and now you're calling them out or or you you want to remove all the people who don't necessarily agree 100% with the way you're running things that's not the reddit way to do stuff so um i'm surprised that that was the tone they struck because I, I don't believe that Reddit for a moment would start banning these uh you know these moderators because if they were to do that they would empty their uh, user base, um, the, the number of users who are on Reddit, pretty quick and in a hurry. It's, you know, Reddit is huge. It's not going to, it's not going to be replaced by anything else anytime soon. But you could kill yourself by, by basically thumbing your nose at your users, and they feel like, you know, you are not in this for us. You're in this for yourself at our expense. That's not a good place for for Reddit to be. Yeah, there's some interesting projects going on, like Lemmy uh, in the Fediverse uh, to provide an alternative. The critical mass isn't there for them yet uh, to to really be a, a strong alternative. Same was true of Mastodon at one point, uh, and then Twitter pushed it far enough that it did get critical mass, and now it is a legitimate alternative. Even if it hasn't replaced Twitter, it's a strong enough community of its own. Uh, I I don't think Reddit wants to get in the position where they push Lemmy or, or any of the others uh, of the Fediverse efforts to that point. On the other hand, this strikes me as somebody trying to hide something this if if 
if they were arguing in good faith, this would look different. This would be Steve Huffman saying, you know, I, I've talked to Christian Selig multiple times, and we, there's just a gap here, and unfortunately the costs are such, uh, but we'll keep trying to work it out. He's saying that about some of the third parties. He's trying to throw shade on the four that have said they can't keep this up and imply that everyone's being reasonable but them. If well, it stops so, there— I mean, Mm. Does this go back to the IPO? Well, mate, you know, no. Like, but you know, it, it, okay, it, okay. But hold, hold, bear with me for a second. Uh, okay. If it stopped there, then I'd be like, well, it, it, it is just the IPO. It's just a cost thing, and they can't get get around it. And he's upset about the people who can't afford it. But he's not just drawing the line there. He's using intimidation tactics. He's he's threatening subreddits by saying, "Hey, got a nice subreddit here. Hate to lo- you would probably hate to lose being the moderator of it, wouldn't you? I'm not going to do that, but I could. That's that's a way to try to scare people into stopping a protest. He's also trying to massage the message and say like, "Hey, I know these these developers are are out there screaming about how unfair they are, but most of the developers aren't and most of the users don't care." That's like political campaigning. That's trying to mold public opinion. That's not good faith negotiation to say like, "Let's see if we can come to an accommodation," which would then show whether those third-party developers were really being unreasonable. Or not and that's not what he's doing so anyway to, to bring it back to your ipo question uh sarah th- that just the fact that they might ipo which he hasn't acknowledged because he can't because it's a confidential ipo is not enough to explain this to me like there's 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 got to be something more you you could mm-hmm. still negotiate in good faith with third-party developers and say i can't really budge on cost with and still have a decent ipo and, and this wouldn't be for every single um, third party application, but I'm shocked that they didn't even have talks with with Apollo to j- do some type of aqua hire. I mean, that sure. that app, uh, I, you know, mm-hmm. I've never used it, mm-hmm. but I but I, I've heard this week that the, the people who do those are the power users of Reddit. Th- those are the folks who are in every day upvoting, downvoting and posting content. So it's kind of shocking that if you know that this is going to affect them to the tune of 20 million dollars a year, you didn't figure something out to where you could make everyone happy so to speak and yeah. it's not like reddit has not heard of apollo and internal memos you no know, of course you know they've talked the to the whole thing has been like we need to make our you know our internal uh, uh tools better um you know not speaking about apollo specifically but like okay well until you do that you're gonna have some yeah. upset people out there and, and and they have they have ground to stand on. Yes, you don't get advertising money from the third party developers. Work on that. Give them an olive branch. Say, look, if you accept our third party ads, uh, then maybe we can give you a break. They haven't done anything like that. And Apollo's dev mm-hmm. even said that he was willing to do that. So there's there's just a lot of parts of this conversation not happening, which imply that there's something else that we're all missing uh, behind that. Well, um, on your next trip, you might want to, you know, check your favorite subreddit when you're visiting, let's say, a national park in the U.S. But you might not be sure you're knowing about all of the national parks that could be <laughs> could be uh, visited on that next trip. Not to fret. Chris Christensen has your back and your backpack. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. When I travel domestically in the U.S., I travel with a national park passport, a paper passport, but there's also an app version of this called just National Park Service that has information about all 420 plus national park units within the United States. And the advantage of using either the paper or the app is you find those parks you wouldn't have known were around, the smaller parks. For instance, I think of being on the big island of Hawaii and getting to Pu'u Oho Nua Oho Nau Nau National Historic Park, which is the second best national park name in the North America, only behind Head Smashed and Buffalo Jump in Canada. But that's a park I wouldn't have known about if it hadn't been for the National Park Passport. And now you can do similar things with the National Park Service app. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Ah, very good park names that, that we learned today, too. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Len Peralta, for being with us, drawing the show. What tech story from the week have you drawn this time? Well, you know, I noticed today, uh, and part of my job is really sort of looking at the the theme of the show, and I noticed a lot of themes today of, 
you know, obviously the Reddit API is seems like it's very contentious. You got uh, Google domains shutting down domains, which could could possibly mm-hmm. be contentious. And so I th- I looked at it not from each thing, but from a bigger point. Uh, and I created a character named Rekt. And uh, Rekt is what I like to call the Internet Ruiner. <laughs> Coming soon, he's already here, man. He's ruined the Internet for everybody. But I don't know. He's I mean, shutting down domains. He's this shutting down it. domains. He's adding yeah. new pricing for Reddit APIs. His, they call him Rekt. <laughs> now we know. <laughs> it's not Steve Huffman. It's Rekt. That's right. It's don't Rex. blame these people. It's just the, 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 the general Internet ruiner mm. of ruining the, the Internet. It's the monster for under your bed. Yeah. Exactly. That's correct. Absolutely. Well, if you like this image and you want to put it up and you're a big fan of Erect, which I can't imagine you wouldn't be, you can go to my uh, Patreon, patreon.com forward slash then you get it immediately if you are a DTNS lover uh, level backer, or you can just go to my old, old fashioned way at my store uh, at lenperaltastore.com where I am also drawing monsters. So if you want a monster for Father's Day or whatever, your graduate. Eh, check me out. So, check, you know, you may want to do that. Dads and grads, check Dads out LenPeraltaStore.com. Absolutely. Uh, Rob Dunwood, I don't know. I, I know you're a dad. Not sure if you have a grad this year, but let folks know where you're uh, hanging out these days. So I celebrated my 17th year in podcasting. I did my first uh, guest appearance 17 years ago last Friday. Oh, and about two nice. years after that. Two years after that, I started my first show, which is still running today, called SMR Podcast. We are 15 years in the game over at SMR Podcast. So that is where folks can go and find me. And then another little show that I launched here on on Daily Tech News Show called The Tech John that I started about two years ago that uh, I'm also running over there as well. Fantastic. Good, good stuff. And congratulations on that anniversary, man. That's awesome. Snuck up on me. Yeah, yeah, I bet. All right, patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. We are going to play a rousing game of who had it first, iOS or Android? And no, the answer will not always be Android. Sometimes iOS did have things first. Uh, we're going to we're gonna test the knowledge of our panel today. Stay tuned for that. <laughs> but just a reminder, we are live, and you can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're going to be off on Monday for the U.S. Juneteenth holiday, but we're back on Tuesday with Patrick Norton joining us. Talk to you then. Have a great weekend. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott Swan, BioCal, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Contributors for this week's shows included Ayaz Akhtar, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, Rob Dunwood, and Chris Christensen. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>